ルのために戦う高尾This theme from Fall of the Samurai strikes me, and the more time passes, the more profound of an effect it has on me. It's filled with sadness, a sense of foreboding marking the end of an era and signifying an uncertain future. It's almost as if the flute player himself is uneasy about what is to come. While he laments the death of an era, and with it, potentially, the death of the past. Where am I even going with this? I've been making Total War videos for a bit over two years at this point. I never once imagined that summer of 2013, during which I sank hours into Shogun 2, that I would be making what may be a career out of it. There is a sense of comfort, knowing that a game I played more than 10 years ago, which left a strong impression on me, is still occupying an important place in my life. At the same time, there is a sense of disappointment at what could have been. I was just a lieutenant back then, doing some wet work. Rome 2 dashed the hopes of many players, which had just been restored with Shogun 2 and its excellent expansion, Follow the Samurai, following the released debacle of Empire in 2009. To this day, Rome 2 is a terrible game, even with most bugs and optimization issues supposedly fixed by a flurry of patches. Combat is still a question of unit quality, where the battle is, for all intents and purposes, a foregone conclusion. And this has been the basis for every Total War game going forward. The campaign is a tedious chore, where you have an arbitrary limit on how many armies you can field, exacerbated by how bloated and empty the map is, and how easily your settlements can be attacked by the AI moving over water, which isn't at all helped by how defenseless the vast majority of settlements are. And again, thanks to army limits, you can't simply reinforce garrisons selectively. You can't toss in just one unit of heavy infantry to put some spine into the defenders, or add just a few archers to cover walls more effectively, or add a unit of cavalry to run down units as they route. You have to expend one of your precious army slots to do so, turning the late game into a nightmare of being stretched thin. I won't go into much detail on these matters though, my other critiques will be linked in the description should you wish to learn more. There is a point that I am trying to illustrate that you may not have picked up on. Rome 2 isn't just a bad game. We don't live in a world where this was just a one-off game without a franchise. Rome 2, being another entry in a long-running franchise, has predecessors that it can be measured against. Predecessors that it must be measured against. The past is not a decadent prison. But the past died. Kill it if you have to. The past is not something that should be forgotten, nor is it something that one should actively seek to destroy or bury. It's not just a terrible attitude to have towards video games, it's a terrible attitude to have in general. History is brimming with examples of people who sought to destroy the past. Under the illusion that in order to build something great, you need to destroy something else. Spoiler alert, it usually ends in disaster. Now, I have to make myself clear here, there is such thing as being trapped in the past. But there is a very, very wide gulf between that and learning from the past. And almost anyone who responds to a video game critique that has evidence footage ranging from campaign gameplay to reproducible unit tests with the counter argument that you're just stuck in the past and you need to move on, has both missed the point and is only making that argument because they themselves are ignorant of the past. No one who has any decent understanding of the past will be making such a close-minded argument. When you know that Shogun 1, the first Total War game, had properly modeled firing drills in 2000, and then hear someone trying to hype up Pharaoh with the claim that formations are coming back, you'll start to wonder if, perhaps, you're the one who has gone insane. Me, on the other hand, I find such ignorance of the past, willing or not, borderline comedy. Major shakeup here. This is an aspect that kind of parallels what CA is seemingly doing on the battle map level. 
According to the developers, Faro is bringing back unit formations in the form of unit stances. <laughs> okay, that, well, that, that gets me every time because the bring back unit formations and unit stances. What have they been doing in the past 10 years? We're going back to... Uh, we've, we've gone from negative 3 back to square 0. Uh, they should have been far beyond this by in 2023, beyond what we had in 2011 or 2010. <laughs> or or 2000 even. I, I talked about... It's like watching a theater play rendition of Lord of the Rings as someone who has watched the movies and read the books and seeing the actors and writers making such huge errors that it leaves me questioning if they have even a tertiary relationship with the source material. And that there is what many grifters rely on for their success. Your ignorance. It's much easier to sell a game like Pharaoh to you if you have little to no experience or knowledge of Total War in its earlier years. But if you do have even a modest amount of time playing Shogun 2 and even Empire Total War, as well as Rome 2 are one of its derivatives, then you will notice the familiar sights in Pharaoh's promotional material. A building tree where the vast majority of bonuses are obscure noun and stat bonuses, ill-defined for new players and uninteresting for veterans. Contrast this to the building tree of Shogun 2, where nearly every building unlocks the ability to recruit a unit or agent. It is so much more pleasant and satisfying to interact with this system, where almost every decision carries a clear, decisive benefit and opportunity cost. Even the stat modifiers that do exist here are handled more gracefully. For example, Master Dojos will cut down samurai recruitment times by a full one turn, or in other words, cutting down their recruitment time by half. Can you honestly argue that the system is not superior to a bunch of texts that offer you extra military supplies or some noun resource of some sort? Once again, the problems and missed opportunities their regressions, they can only truly come to light when you take a trip back to previous installments. This is why I encourage anyone who has played newer Total War games to grab some of the older games, ideally on sale, if only just to play them for a few hours. The differences don't take that long to show themselves. The Oda, the faction whose early game I have mastered more than any other faction in Shogun 2, can blitz through the southeastern corridor as seen here all while upgrading their interior roles to allow their units to more quickly be shipped to the front. You are defeating superior forces in the field while keeping the logistical situation under your thumb. You can quickly move these new recruits on a different axis should an attack emerge from an unexpected direction. You simply cannot do this in a game like Rome 2. Managing armies, if you can even call it that, comes down to placing your general one pixel within your territory, so that you can spam recruitment there and have the units teleport into your army the next turn. There is no thought about how you are going to get the units there, whether you should even place your general that close to danger, whether you need to secure a road or recruitment center against attack. It gets even worse in Warhammer, where global recruitment means that so long as you have one building somewhere in your empire, you can access that building's respective units. And while they do take longer to recruit in this manner and cost more, money is not difficult to come by, and there is no turn limit on the campaign. A long-running issue that has marred these games, and strategy games in general, has been the question of the late game. How do you even make a credible late game challenge? I have brought up Realm Divide before as a generally competent answer to this issue, but more recently I discovered that the original Shogun game had a fail state if all your family members were killed. In virtually every other Total War game, your faction will survive and your game can be continued even if the ruling family is wiped out. And in later games, you can't even permanently lose your faction leader. The only fail states are losing your last province or reaching the turn limit, if there is one even. Shogun 1's family extinction fail state, based on the testimony of people who have much more experience in it than myself, sounds like it would add another interesting dimension to the gameplay. Without it, Total War becomes more and more like the myriad of strategy games on the market that are commonly referred to as map painting simulators. 
design flaws, design flaws, that's enough of them. What about missed opportunities? The other day I received this comment arguing that a Total War game set in World War I would not be feasible, based on the difficulties of simulating vehicular combat. The first thing that popped into my head was Empire Total War, the first Total War game to feature real-time naval battles, and they were actually a bright spot. All of the guns are individually modeled and therefore can be disabled individually. The same applies to masts and sails, allowing you to severely damage an enemy ship's maneuverability. The crew members themselves are individual entities that can be killed by shot or during boarding attacks. This was in 2009. For perspective's sake, that was the era of 4-core, four 4-thread four Intel CPUs and graphics cards that had under 1GB of video memory. I refuse to believe that 14 years have passed and we lack the technology or the know-how to feature proper vehicular combat in a video game. What I take from this comment and similar ones is that there is a sort of pride or virtue in being ignorant of the past. Not just blissfully ignorant, but proudly so. Got it. Doors coming online now. You gotta be shitting me! Yeah, guys, can't you make it open faster? Negative, sir. You can try pulling it if it makes you feel better. Cheeky bastard. Then there's the memory of bad business practices. You don't need to spend much time on Total War forums to find people defending overpriced DLCs. The reason usually being that this is just how the industry is, or that some people find them valuable and that's all that really matters because all value is apparently subjective. All I can think of when reading such defenses is Follow the Samurai, a standalone expansion to Shogun 2 which was basically a full game on its own, being sold at expansion level pricing. That is not to say of course that uh, bad business practices weren't a thing back then. Most of the DLC units were pointless chaff after all. It's bad enough that a long list of DLCs will only increase the barrier to entry for people considering a game during the later phases of its life cycle. The fact that none of these extra offerings are doing anything meaningful to address the core design issue as mentioned earlier makes it worse. Clear right. Go. Forward area clear. Up. Look at this place. 50,000 people used to live in the city. Now it's a ghost town. Another all too common counter argument I find crawling in the comments section is the fabled historical versus fantasy dichotomy. You've probably heard of this one before. It is yet another example of a bad faith argument that is also oftentimes completely ignorant of the past. It ignores the fact that one of the most popular, if not the most popular mod ever made for this series was the Third Age mod for Medieval 2. It's a form of historical revisionism. I started playing the mod not longer after its original release in 2010 and would hang around on forums and not once do I remember encountering any sort of anti-fantasy or pro-history nonsense. It's a completely fabricated distinction that only seeks to breed an us versus them mentality and conveniently steers clear of any fruitful discussion of game mechanics. And specifically for those who think I'm a historical fanboy, because of the Third Age mod, I never played the vanilla Medieval 2 until 2015. Make of that what you will. And for those of you in the back uh, who try to dismiss my arguments with the claim that I'm nostalgic towards Shogun 2, this is an ad hominem that does not address any of the technical issues I bring up in my videos. You're just sidestepping all of the points I bring up. There's a reason I go to great lengths to include reference footage for whatever point I'm trying to make. It's so that you don't have to take my word for it. I have footage showcasing unit tests in Warhammer 2, proving both that unit quality is the overwhelming factor in determining the outcome of an engagement, while terrain provides a negligible advantage, if any at all. You can load up the game right now and reproduce those results. This is something that exists without me and beyond me. Well, at least the world didn't then. Hit it. Enemy truck, six 
Finally, this war on the past takes on another grotesque form in the claim that Total War's design issues either are made up by out-of-touch older fans or that they simply don't matter when the series has become more financially successful by appealing to a wider audience. I am going to start by heading this off at the pass and reiterating that almost all of the points raised in my critiques are principally concerned with design issues, including poor unit balancing, poorly thought out difficulty options, hostile user interfacing, and so on. These are elements that exist outside and irrespective of player counts, the merits of which can be assessed without referring to Steam charts. But you know what, forget it. Let's entertain the popularity argument for a bit. The first problem is that CA seems to have never been very transparent about their game's sales counts, which means we have to rely on Steam chart player counts for the sake of this discussion, which are themselves only very representative of the more recent games. But even with the somewhat limited data, the popularity argument falls apart. We'll begin at Rome 2, which indeed saw commercial success at launch, breaking 120,000 concurrent players on day one. However, given the game's terrible release state as well as its major design regressions, the franchise would suffer major long-term damage. The real extent of the damage wouldn't become apparent until Attila's release in 2015. That game never managed anything higher than 30,000 concurrent players. For a small-time studio releasing their first game, 30,000 concurrent players is a solid number. But not for the UK's largest game developer and another installment in a long-running franchise. Player activity did see some recovery with the first Warhammer Total War game, but given the memory of Rome 2, it is reasonable to assume that the success came down more to the Warhammer part of the game, and less because of the Total War aspect. It was in 2019 that the series finally seemed to have fully recovered commercially, with Three Kingdoms breaking far past Rome 2's records, hitting nearly 200,000 concurrent players on launch day. Now, given how recent this was, you may know where that game ended up. Barely two years after its release, Three Kingdoms was killed off in a bizarre announcement by the developers. Today, Warhammer 3 is the only game in the franchise to boast what can be considered a decently sized player base at about 25,000 concurrent players. It is again unclear how many copies this game sold, and the option to play on Game Pass would only muddy the figures further, but what isn't said is sometimes more important than what is said, and in this case CA has never published any press release or any sort of announcement boasting the sales success of Warhammer 3. Their silence on the matter can only mean the game wasn't the commercial success they had hoped it would be. Putting this all together, after of course adding the abysmal player counts of Thrones of Britannia and Troy, there are far more Total War games released since 2013 that have been flops than commercial successes, and one of those commercial successes was abandoned just a few years after its release. And before anyone claims that Troy was more successful when we factor in the game's availability for free on Epic at launch, remember that a large number of people will pick up a game for free just because they can, not because they have a strong desire to actually play it. I bet that most of the people watching this video right now have a Steam library full of games they got on sale but never got around to actually playing them. Troy was given for free with the intention of it being a loss leader. CA would take a loss on all these copies, hoping to recoup them by getting people into the door to buying other Total War games. They got the loss part right, but seemed to have forgotten the other half, based on another cursory look at the Steam Charts performance for the other titles. The people making the sales argument, which is in any case a dumb argument for players to be making when they should be demanding better games, appear to have not spent even a token amount of time looking at publicly available player counts for these games. 25,000 concurrent players would be a dream for any up-and-coming developer, but again, not a big budget studio, especially when Warhammer 3 has had a multi-year long build-up and is the conclusion to a Total War sub-series that had the benefit of a well-known IP. Warhammer 3 barely qualifies to get into the top 50 most played games on Steam. With all that said, was it really worth destroying everything the franchise stood for, stripping battles of all their depth and campaigns of their open-endedness for this? Anyway, thanks for watching. I originally meant for this video to be a simple response to multiple counter-arguments I often receive in my comments section, but what piqued my interest was the underlying theme of an ignorance of the past 
or worse, a contempt for it. The worst kind I have received is a simultaneous acknowledgement of the past, followed by a plea to leave it behind. Adapting to the times, or so they say, is a very dystopian sounding statement to me. All I can really hear is someone begging me to lower my standards like everyone else. Alright, I'm not actually done here. There is one sentiment that I wish to comment on, but I didn't want to give it the honor of a dedicated chapter. The whole negativity, hand-waving that can inevitably be found under any video not baselessly hyping up unreleased games. The comment would make any amount of sense only if I was the one who made these games. It's not my fault that they are as bad as I and others have documented, and it's not in my interest, nor is it my responsibility to make excuses for their flaws. And to the people insisting you need to stop being negative, I can only ever agree to do so if we apply the same standard to the other side of the aisle. Because, as it turns out, baselessly hyping up games that haven't released yet, from a series that boasts a track record of botched releases, unimaginative sequels, and abandoned games, will hardly incur any comments stating you're too positive. You just can't have it one way.